Welcome to the Got Invention Show. I'm your host, Brian Freed, and today we have Lisa Barnett. She is the president of Little Spoon. Thank you for joining us, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Lisa, you have a great story and a great company that you've built, and it's continuing and getting very popular out there. I'm honored to have you on the show tonight, so thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm honored right back at you to be on, on your show. So feelings Thank mutual. you, Lisa. Thank you. So why don't you start off by telling us who you are and where you're from? And that looks like a very interesting background behind you. So <laughs> maybe you can tell us where you are right now. Yeah, sure. Well, currently I'm in New York City, which is where Little Spoon's headquartered. Um, I'm sitting in one of my conference rooms at the office. Um, I am originally from New York, Long Island. Um, and I have been working for, you know, over a decade in the consumer space across all different, you know, areas, functions, verticals, started out in deep data analytics and strategy work, and then moved to actually internal incubation where I got to cut my teeth in e-commerce for the first time way back when the first direct-to-consumer brands were just getting started um, in the beauty industry. And from there, spent some time in venture capital investing in companies um, from consumer healthcare to consumer products like Little Spoon um, and have have found my way uh, into the world of children's nutrition um, with, with Little Spoon. Very interesting. Now, coming from the world of venture capital, you had a chance to see type of companies that succeeded and also maybe didn't succeed as much. I don't like to use the other word, but <laughs> what do you think the real opportunity was there for companies to really flourish that way? You know, I think what I learned uh, from being an investor in venture capital, and I kind of did this in the in the reverse direction, um, while I was kind of internally incubating uh, digitally native companies in the context of like large corporations before getting into venture, I had never operated my very own startup before. Um, I didn't have my own, my own idea or my own company. Um, so it's kind of interesting to look at it both my shoes when I was in venture, as well as now, you know, over six years into my own business, uh, what I think. But I learned a few fundamental things in terms of really focusing on, uh, and you'll probably hear me say this a lot, really solving a problem. And the founders that are successful are hyper-focused on what problem they are trying to solve versus what idea they have to solve it. Um, and that is a really significant shift in Orient um, that is subtle, but really has made all the difference, both in the companies I've invested in in the past, as well as how I approach building Little Spoon right now. We love to learn about Little Spoon, of course, but just your experience of learning how to take your idea and bring it to reality, not even that, but to raise money and bring it to market in different aspects is really something very interesting. So thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. Why don't you tell us about Little Spoon? This is an unbelievable story. I'm so excited to have you mm -hmm. on the show. It's really developed into something special. So why don't you start off by telling us actually what I'll also do, Lisa, is I'll pull up the website so we oh, can great. take a peek at it in, in the meantime. Yeah, take a peek. First, I'll take a step back so you all know what in the world we're talking about when we're talking about Little Spoon. Um, we are a national direct-to-consumer children's food and nutrition company. So we're all about really reinventing the modern parents' experience of how they go about keeping their children healthy. Um, our mission is really how can we make keeping your kid healthy a super simple, easy part of a parent's day. Um, so we offer fresh organic baby food, toddler snacks, kids' meals, all clean, all super fresh, and all united under a product philosophy of we'll never compromise on quality, um, but we will always deliver you accessible and affordable price points. Um, and everything is delivered to your door, um, and it is a subscription business model. And, you know, before I get started on how we got started and how I got into this, um, just to orient everyone, you know, we've raised over $60 million in venture capital. We've launched over 100 different products um, in under five years' time and have become the fastest growing baby and kids' food brand in the country um, that is supported and underlied by the largest parenting community out there, which I'm sure we will touch on later. Um, so that's a little bit about Little Spoon. I can dive into how in the world, by the way, I'm not a parent, how I got into building products for parents and for children. 
Um, so as you know, you mentioned, Brian, I came from the venture capital world right before starting Little Spoon. Um, and, you know, I, throughout all of my experience, had always been, you know, one commonality in all the different things that I've done has been that I've been obsessive about the female consumer. It's something, you know, obviously I can personally relate to. Um, and it was something that I always looked at and even drove a lot of my investment theses uh, when I was making investments in the venture capital space. Um, so, you know, I was in the consumer world, the corporate world, went through business school, ended up in VC and doing early stage investing. And, you know, I became very fixed on a couple of big macro trends, which one was no one seemed to be meeting the needs of this generation and particularly this generation of women. Um, I spent all my time watching myself and my coworkers, you know, look at companies that were winning by targeting this generation and understanding why parents, mothers uh, were fundamentally different today versus what they were a decade ago. You know, these are products that and companies, you know, that were becoming billion dollar companies merely by rethinking an experience in a category through the lens of a very different consumer. So think like, you know, all the dog food innovation, uh, mattresses, everything. It's all the same consumer that these companies were rebuilding a business model around. Um, and second, I was noticing, you know, and this was over six years ago, we were hitting an inflection point. Um, these same consumers that are buying mattresses and starting to get pets we're now in mass becoming parents. Um, in 2016, it was like four out of five babies were born to a millennial parent. Today, it's like five out of five are born to a millennial parent, right? We launched in 2018. That wasn't an accident. Um, these are parents that are different. These are mothers that are different and they're bringing different behaviors and standards to what they're purchasing for themselves as well as for their children once they have them. And, you know, going back to my focus on you know, the, the female consumer, the burden of childcare generally falls disproportionately to women. This is something that was a personal implication to me, though I'm not a mother yet. I was thinking far ahead into my future saying like, how am I going to do it all? I want to feed my child healthy food, yet the baby food on the grocery store shelf is on average two years old. It's literally older than the baby eating it. Um, so how was it that we haven't provided like the resources for a fresh quality option that was actually excessively priced, given the expectations we put on parents and we put on mothers and this changing lifestyle of the woman who is, you know, more likely than not in the workforce. And there's more likely than not a dual income household. Um, and this was right around the time that my sister had her first kid. And so I really started thinking about how can I improve this experience? It seems so unnecessarily hard to do the right thing as a parent. Um, and despite how important it is to feed your child such high quality food, high quality nutrition during these like early years, like the first seven years of a child's life, there's literally nothing out there. It was crazy to me that there was that gap and I couldn't get it out of my head. And it just so happened that my co-founders who came from the food industry also couldn't get that out of their head. So we united together um, under a common mission to figure out not just like your first solids, but every single step of the way, once you start feeding your child, how can we simplify that process, make it cheaper, make it easier and make it higher quality for a parent? Well, like every invention, there's an idea that has to come out of what it is that was a problem that you came up with the solution for. So I always say an invention is really like coming up with a business because you have to do the research development and the product development and whatever it is, or a business to end up bringing it to market that way. And you, you and your colleagues, right? You and your co-founders did the same thing. You had the experience to understand the back end part of it, where the venture capital and what was making it out there and your Co-founders also being in the food industry, you put things together, you started to realize that there was an opportunity out there and you took advantage of it, which is amazing. Let's take a look at the website, Lisa. If you can walk us through what this is all about, because this is unbelievable. Show Thank us. You. Absolutely. So when you come to the website, you can either press get started or actually if you go into the hamburger menu on the left hand side there, yes. um, you can explore our products, right? So organized right now by the offerings we have. We have a line of fresh purees called Baby Blend, so you can click right into that. 
we have, and for those of you who aren't parents out there, um, kids eat, you know, food starting with super simple purees all the way up to very chunky textured, you know, pinchable items. And we have every stage, if you scroll down, we make it really easy for the consumer um, to sort of select what stage um, you want to look at. You know, if you want to click into any one of these products, um, you'll start to notice a commonality, which is that we are very transparent with our ingredients. We're very transparent about what's in there. If you look at, you know, this is pear, and obviously this is a, a simple blend, but it's literally straight up just if you look at the nutrition label, um, which we include in that little plus sign there, you'll see it's literally organic pear. That's all that's in it. Um, and that is consistent with every single other baby blend we have, whether there's one ingredient or six plus ingredients. It's all just the organic fruit, vegetable, or superfood pureed up and made super simple for, for you to feed your child. Um, we offer a line of kids meals, um, which are called plates, which you saw in that menu earlier, and a line of um, squeezy pouch smoothies, which are designed to be a snack supplement. And we see customers from six months all the way to eight years old purchase those. Wow. Um, so lots of product options out there. And again, I mentioned earlier, Little Spoon is a subscription business model. So to your point about every invention is an idea, I'd say the extra step when you want to come to commercialize it is like, how do you make sure you can make money off it? One is making sure you're solving a real problem, but two is making sure you can create a business model that's both good for your customer as well as good for a sustainable business. For us, that meant a subscription model. Um, and since you're predictably feeding your child meals uh, at a normal cadence, it's pretty easy for a consumer to kind of opt into a subscription. Um, if this were a different category, you know, I saw in my venture capital days a lot, there were a lot of companies, particularly when subscription became like a thing um, in the direct to consumer world. There were a lot of companies that were subscription for, sub for subscription sake, frankly, just a buzzword. Um, not something that makes sense for every product that you're selling. For us, it really did. And that's been obviously a a core part of the business model and something that we don't intend on ever changing. You and your co-founders put the idea together and it all looks wonderful and fantastic right now, but I'm sure it didn't start off that way and just kind of go through. Maybe it did. Why don't you walk us through when you put the idea together and really started to hammer down on what it's going to look like and how it's going to work. And then most importantly, being able to source the ingredients and packaging. And maybe you could share that story with us so we can really understand how an idea like this, a subscription-based food service for mothers, for toddlers, for not just for mothers, for fathers too, to Absolutely. be able to make this into what it is today. So kind of put us under the hood to start with. Yeah. I mean, it, it was not easy. I'd say the first thing about starting a company or making an idea a reality is like making sure you have the right people around you because you're simply never going to know everything. And I do think the best entrepreneurs are ones that are self-aware enough to know what they don't know. Um, so for me, that involved not just my co-founders, which we balanced ourselves out really well. My co-founder, um, for example, has experience in you know, cold chain, which basically means if you have a perishable food product needs to remain temperature controlled throughout every stage of the process in the supply chain. That's what he did beforehand. So he had experience working with suppliers that were all cold chain that helped build out that process. I, on the other hand, have experience in not just finance and fundraising, but e-commerce businesses, revenue generating businesses, um, brands, products, things like that. Um, so there was a really nice marriage between the two of us because we really balanced each other out with the front of the house and the back of the house experience. So that helped a ton. Um, not to say that there weren't a ton of challenges, but I think, you know, we started out with a very clear problem in mind that we wanted to create a experience for parents of this generation that really simplifies things from starting solids all the way up through those big kid years. We knew we always wanted to span early childhood, not just the period stage, but we needed to get started in one place and period seemed to be the right place to get started since it's one of the first things you're purchasing as a parent and that level of trust that you can garner can really scale lifetime value over time. Um, you know, once we, 
we kind of had all of that vision set in stone. It was like, okay, how do we find the suppliers and make sure that the ingredients are of quality? And that really is brute force and a lot of time and energy. It's not necessarily rocket science though. And I'm sure many of you listening are working on things that might actually be an invention that's a technological you know, change or innovation for us. We really looked at this as business model innovation. So it was about just making sure we were hitting the standards that we wanted to hit with the suppliers that we were building a network and relationships with. Um, and once doing that, lots of negotiations in terms of where we can produce the food, how can we even afford to produce that food? And at the end of the day, what you realize is that building the product is actually not even necessarily as hard as selling the product. Um, and I think that's where you start. we started to rubber hit the road where, you know, challenge one was not getting SKUs produced, but how do we generate awareness? How do we get people to try us? By the way, at the exact right time, given how small of a window we were targeting at that time, we only had pureed baby food. Um, for those of you who don't know, I will remind you, and I think ignorance is bliss when I got started in this, um, but I learned very quickly, obviously, as I'm diving into this space, kids only eat pureed food from like six months to maybe 10, 11 months if you're lucky. That is an incredibly small window that you need to then target a consumer, get them to make a decision and feed their child before you lose them. You lose the opportunity. Um, so that was really difficult. Um, and I realized and looked at you know, our business and we had the fortune of taking in some angel investments. So we did have some dry powder to work with, but not a ton. So I personally, you know, in charge of kind of launching and, and you know, the customer acquisition and the brand building side of the business said to myself, how do I do this without really spending any money? And we maybe spent $30,000, $40,000 total in marketing for the first year. Um, yet we grew, we grew and sold over a million meals in our first year. Um, wow. And that really came from, you know, how we went about building the company. And I'll get it, maybe get into that later. Um, but the second challenge I will say, going back to the food, is that it was perishable food. So there was no room for error. Meaning like if deliveries were delayed, if the package was jostled around and we didn't figure out the logistics of how to pack it, you were getting a terrible experience as a consumer. The, the, the containers would break, the food would be, would go bad. It wasn't so simple as sending, you know, a non-perishable item or non-food item even in the mail. We were sending something that you needed to receive and put in your refrigerator and it needed to look good because you need to trust it enough to feed it to your six-month-year-old child. Wow. You have this window to really be able to sell the product. And that was really your focus. The first one was the perishable puree food. Yes. So that was tight. It's almost like when I talk to inventors and they come up with an idea that's seasonal, you only have a short window to really make it happen. So how do you expand that window of opportunity? And you did that as you grew, but you have to start somewhere. Lisa, do you feel like it needs to be perfect to launch. Did did Was that your experience? Did you all need to have it that way or did you kind of just go with the flow? You know, no, I think like perfect's the enemy of, of you know, everything. Um, I think that it's really hard, especially if you're, you know, if you're committed and passionate enough to want to launch a product, an invention, anything, the odds are not in your favor, right? Like you have some level of delusion about yourself. And so those tend to be people who are fairly detail oriented, fairly obsessive, and you have to be willing to be detail oriented because there's literally no one else to pick up the slack. It's just you. Um, so I do caution around being, you know, really identifying what is your MVP and getting out there and getting feedback. I've always you know, even taking that a step further, I've always been of the mentality that you should never be precious with your ideas. Like, you know, if someone else steals your idea, then it's half the success is about execution. Like ideas are a dime a dozen. Um, I, there are no, I, I don't really believe there are any novel ideas. They all stem from somewhere and we all are thinking about similar things. Um, so it's really a lot about execution. And I think that the MVP concept, which means, you know, minimum viable product. So how can you make sure your product hits the minimum requirements to do what you're hoping for it to do, 
but it's quicker to get out there, get feedback and iterate because you're not going to hit product market fit right away. For us, that just meant make sure we have a safe product because it's, you know, we're dealing with children eating our food. We started out with purees. We're doing slightly older kids now up to seven years old, but still it's a child and it's a human. Um, and make sure we, we had an experience where we can get you that product. We can build the product safely. We can get that product to you safely. Then our mentality was like, keep it small. We launched in a beta program, right? And we got you, we got just the New York area on board. And we said, okay, we're going to get 200, 300 customers. And we're going to make sure we literally talk to every single one of those customers. Um, and that's where doing things that are, you know, purposely unscalable for a period of time can be really valuable. And that's when it comes to having an MVP product uh, where it could be really powerful because you're purposely trying to get feedback and you're actually bringing consumers along in that journey and they become really passionate loyalists because they feel like they're a part of the mission that you have. For us, it's about making parents' lives easier, which is something a lot of parents, you know, we're really excited to get behind. Makes total sense. Lisa, just to touch on it, because the idea came to reality, you expanded and have different product lines for the subscription-based business that you developed. But one thing that we started off with by talking about you having co-founders, how important is it for an idea or even in your business or even the ideas and the businesses that you've seen prior in your venture capital time, how important is it to have the right partners and find the right partners and work with them? Because let's face it, if you don't, you're on your own and you talked about execution also. So how important is kind of all that put, putting it together? Having the right partners is more important than having a partner, in my opinion. Meaning if you can't find the right people, but you still feel confident you can do this, maybe you bring on founding team members later, I don't think that should be a deterrent. It's more impactful to you in the negative if you have the wrong partners, because that, yes, there are ways you can structure things to, to solve for that. And like for every great media story you read out there, uh, there's a lot of crap, for lack of a better word, that goes into building that and a lot of, you know, challenges and conflict. You're dealing with people who are really passionate, who really care about the problem and have distinct experiences and philosophies. And to the extent you can align at least on a fundamental level with those philosophies with a partner, you'll be more successful. If you could then on top of that, find partners that balance you out from a skill set perspective, like awesome. Um, but it's it's pretty much a make or break. I mean, I'm very much a person who believes you're the average of the people you spend most of your time with. And that can you can extrapolate that out to like your business is only as good as your lowest common denominator of leadership. Right. Like it's only it's going to average. It's going to take the average down if you're with if you're bringing the wrong people in with the wrong amount of influence and uh, in how you're approaching your invention or your startup. Um, That's a great lesson. Yeah. <laughs> Great lesson. It's a Lisa, good lesson. Take it to heart. You mentioned earlier that you sold the first year a million subscriptions. A million meals. A million meals. Yes. Now, a couple of, that was in 2018 or 2019 was that the was over the course of 2018. Yes. Over the first. course. Here you are. You look like you're loving what you do. You're in Manhattan. There's the website looks amazing. You have your subscriptions going. Tell us about the success that you've kind of got to at this point and what kind of publicity have you received from where you are today? Yeah, I mean, I I sort of mentioned earlier, you know, we've been able to launch over 100 different products and that's been incredible. We've been able to touch so many families um, out there. I mean, it's kind of incredible when you think about, you know, how many people we've been able to hopefully, what we believe hopefully help. Um, and, you know, the, obviously what came along with that over 60 million in venture capital, all amazing things. I would say the thing that I'm most proud about and that gets a lot of publicity and attention is actually our underlying mission. So in the process of starting Little Spoon, I launched a parenting community called Is This Is This Normal? And that there's actually, if you want to go to the website while I'm talking, it's isthisnormal.co. Um, that is an extrapolation of our broader mission to help make parents' lives easier. It's a modern day Q&A, 
you know, advice, advice column where you have access to one medical pediatrics and all these other experts where you can ask any question and also connect with fellow parents. That advice column, definitely not that. Is this normal.co? <laughs> oh, .co. Got yeah, it. tricked you on that one. Um, I hope <laughs> not that. Um, and I think that, you know, in starting Is This Normal, we were able to really continue to build this movement around, hey, it's not, because keeping in mind the problem I was trying to solve, it's not fair that parents have no such a lack of resources, nowhere to go when it comes to being a parent. Um, and that's really hard. And I think that we've gotten a lot of publicity around this parenting community um, because it was built you know, as part of this, honestly, for lack of a better term, like a social movement that we're, that we're trying to change the status quo when it comes to what it means to be a parent. And that basic principle of like, hey, we had a common enemy that we united our consumers around, which is that like, it's been insufficient that the existing baby food options were highly processed and shelf stable. It's been insufficient that over COVID, you know, half the workforce was affected, mostly women, because there was no childcare and no support. Um, we're trying to change that in part with our products, but in part with is this normal, the community. And, you know, we've gotten the attention of many different celebrities. Serena Williams is involved in our company. Um, lots of other really incredible people. One medical pediatrics has become, as I mentioned before, an expert that answers questions to our community. And we're really proud of that because we're taking our platform and hopefully continuing to extend help and resources to more and more people, even if they're not purchasing our products. Wow. You're an inspiration, Lisa. I know your co-founders and, and you all are doing an amazing job. Littlespoon.com. The other website was isthisnormal.co, right? Yes. Is this there normal? is a link on the main site too. Don't worry. <laughs> right. And I didn't, I'm putting you on the spot here. I don't know if there's a coupon code that you know of that any of the listeners in our audience or watchers can use, I will, or I can put. Up, so you can put one in the notes, and I Perfect. will get you guys a special, a special Brian coupon. <laughs> thank you very much. Got Invention Show, Lisa. Thank you very much. Let's keep in touch and let's continue this conversation on the next level of the journey of bringing Little Spoon to even greater heights. So thank you very much, Lisa. Really appreciate you being on our show this evening and uh, keep doing what you're doing. Make it happen and make your dreams a reality. That's what it's all about. That is what it's all about. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Lisa. All right. That was very interesting. A lot of great lessons learned there. If you'd like to be a guest on the Got Invention Show, you can go to gotinventionshow.com. Until then, keep inspiring. Keep keep taking your ideas and bringing them to the next level, make them a reality. See you soon. Mm -hmm.